So uh, welcome to the iceberg. Your ad hack surface just got bigger and also helped to mitigate risk in your open source projects. Cool, so what are we gonna talk about today? So first of all, I'm gonna give a little bit of overview of the current state of uh, open source uh, software and some cybersecurity challenges that we have. We're also gonna have a look at the iceberg and it might be like this little emoji saying, what are you gonna talk about? What is the iceberg? Um, I'm also gonna talk about the GitHub Marketplace and how we can leverage tools on the GitHub Marketplace to uh, secure and create a uh, secure pipeline. Um, also, I'm going to give some tips on how to harden your uh, OSS projects and some learnings on that. Cool. So, first of all, let's uh, let's have a look at what is uh, open source software. So, the term has been coined by uh, Christine Pearson in 19, 18, uh, 1998. And he coined the term open source uh, software, and this was a deliberate effort to make this field of endeavor more understandable to newcomers and to businesses. And this was also the first year. Uh, there was the open source summit organized by O'Reilly. And we have, the definition is around like authors make, the, uh, make their source code available to, um, to everyone, to view it, to copy, to learn from it, to change it, to share it. So this is the, the essence of open source software. And so many people around the world uh, prefer using OSS for several reasons. Um, that it's regarded as more uh, stable for long-term projects, and also it's considered as more secure than proprietary uh, software because there's many people and contributors that can spot an error and raise a PR to propose some changes uh, so anyone can view and modify it. Nevertheless, having said that, it comes with its own set of security challenges. So let's have a look at some of the open source software attacks. One of them is uh, typo squatting attacks. So typo squatting attacks usually take place when bad actors push malicious package to a uh, registry with the hope of tricking users into installing them. This is really similar to what you have with website phishing attacks that exploit typos made by individuals who may accidentally type in a wrong address. So in this example, if the package React with a typo, in that case, you will not install React, unfortunately, but you will install a malicious package that has a completely different end goal. Another example is a malicious package which injects malicious code into a software product in order to compromise the dependency systems further down the chain. In this example, we're having fall guys, and usually the malicious actor will try to surf on trends. So in that case, that game has been quite popular during the pandemic, and user might think that by downloading this package, it will have an advantage in the game to be like cosmetics for the, um, your, your character or other things that you can use during the, the game. Uh, fall guys is a malicious package that contains malicious code that attempts to read local sensitive files and exfiltrate information through a Discord webhook. In that case, the entry point was a Discord webhook. Another example is Compromising maintainers, uh, where malicious actors will use uh, social engineering methods to gain access to open source projects. Here we have an instance with the event stream package where the malicious actor did um, social engineering the, uh, the maintainers. So basically he went through all the issues and he was looking how we could push um, some, some features and obviously push his malicious payload. So at first, uh, to build up the trust, he pushed some cosmetic changes. So changing the readme file, the CSS files, and then we build up the trust with the maintainer. He wants to get more permissions. And then he pushes malicious payload, which was targeting a Bitcoin wallet. So his modus operandi in that case was interesting because going through all the issues and see if he can contribute, be trusted, and then push his code. So this is known as a supply chain uh, attack, also called third party attack. And this occurs uh, generally when someone infiltrates your system through an outside partner or provider with access to your system and data. The bad news is it doesn't affect only uh, JavaScript packages, it affects all of your uh, ecosystems. And we had a recent example last year with uh, the log for shell within the uh, Java community. And supply chain attack is quite attractive for uh, hackers because when commonly used software or packages are compromised, the attacker could potentially gain access to all the enterprise that use that software. So in a software supply chain attack, attackers usually use malicious code to compromise an upstream component in the, sh in the chain with the end goal of compromising the target of the attack, which is the downstream component. So compromising the upstream component is not the end goal, it's merely just opening a window for the attackers to compromise the target of the attack by inserting malware, as we've seen uh, previously with some of the packages, or providing a backdoor for future access, for example. So why application security is important, you might, you might ask. Well, vulnerabilities can originate from something as simple as a config error or using a software component that has a known vulnerability uh, known vulnerability, which is by why maintaining and improving an application security program is really, really important for businesses, for maintainers, for contrib contributors, for everyone. There's one recent study that revealed that out of 85,000 applications that were analyzed, 83% contain at least one security flow, and of these, 20% has a severe vulnerability. 
while we know that not all of these vulnerabilities necessarily present a major risk, hackers continue to refine by using ingenious workarounds to penetrate softwares. And we have obviously organizations such as OWASP that track vulnerabilities found and provide a list that developers and security teams can use as a starting point for their application security program. So let's try to understand how is this possible. And let's say, all say hi to the iceberg. You might be confused, like what was she talking about? Uh, but let me, let, me, let me explain it to you. So first of all, at the tip of the iceberg, you have your code. This is potentially um, the code that you're writing uh, in your, your company. This is the proprietary code um, that could potentially have security vulnerability within. Uh, in that case, that's a piece of code that is importing a dependency, which is actually a nice segue to the layer below the application code on the, uh, the iceberg, where you have the open source code. If we think about how many lines of code you, we write ourselves versus the number of uh, packages that we import to cut down the time we spend coding. Well, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, uh, and this is totally understandable, so, um, because why would we want to waste some time rewriting something that might probably exist as a package in our ec ecosystem? That's what we have here with the uh, Mark package, which says implementing Markdown in, um, so we could use Markdown in our application. But now we're bringing several packages into our, our code base, as you can see, all these little NPM packages. And this increased uh, the attack surface and introduced new risks. So I do have a few questions for you. So uh, are, are you aware of all the packages that you have within your, your code base? Uh, are you aware of all the dependencies and sub-dependencies? Do you have a good understanding of indirect and transitive dependencies? Do you have tools that actually help you having that level of understanding and visibility? And also, what are the risks that you bring um, when you bring a dependency in your code base? I know that's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> I know, <laughs> uh, but let's see some numbers around that. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention specifically to the, um, the last one, which is the average number of days it takes to fix a vulnerability. It's almost around 100 days. Uh, the average number of astounding, outstanding critical vulnerabilities in an application, but this also depends on the, um, your programming language, is around five. And the average dependencies, top level dependencies per project is around 80. So let's go back to our iceberg because we have only seen two, two levels. Now we're going down to the containers level because an application needs to be deployed somewhere. So we're using containers or we're using static website to deploy our projects. So we're using different ways to do so. We could use Docker, Versil, Netlify, cloud providers, you name it. But for, the, uh, for Docker, we're adding a Docker file now in the equations, which has metadata about our, about our project. And this is an additional layer for a modern application. We're running our, our application as Docker images, and this adds to complexity and increase our attack surface. So let's have a look at a really basic Docker file. I know this is like a really basic one, but what could go wrong with this one? Well, a lot of things, let's see them. So first of all, if we have a look at the, um, the common software vulnerabilities that we, we don't know on that. Uh, in that case, um, this is image, image Magic, which is a package used to resize your image. And this uh, specific packages has so many vulnerabilities that they actually created a website, dedicated website to go through all the, uh, the vulnerabilities that they had. Uh, going from XML injection to remote code execution, fun. Um, another one is to have a look at the defensive um, vulnerable if you have, when you do the run NPM install, in that case, might be uh, actually better to have the flag only production to avoid pulling dev dependencies and non-deterministic package install. Um, and also probably to have multi-stage build uh, Docker. So when you develop and you have a larger image because you want to experiment. And when you move to production, you have um, a slinger image with less vulnerability. Also, are we looking at the security releases? In that case, we're fetching a uh, node, but what about the security bulletin? Did we have a look at it? Because if we're picking a large image, it might have many vulnerable libraries. Are we aware of all of these? So we've seen three layers. What's the last layer? What could be the last layer? Just asking if you have any ideas. Infrastructure as code. <laughs> cool. Uh, so infrastructure as code is an approach to manage data center um, uh, servers, storage, and networking infrastructure. It's meant to simplify large scale, scale configuration and management. And this is where you provision your resources through code and you make it your single source of truth, where you specify explicitly uh, through code all the infrastructure's specification in your config file. So it's amazing. You can version, version control, you can test it, you can monitor. This is amazing. But you also have security vulnerabilities on it. Uh, the number one is cloud misconfiguration. And this is one of the most common vulnerabilities that organization will face. 
And this refers to any glitches, uh, gaps, or errors that could expose your environment to risk during cloud adoption. And you have a few examples here at the bottom uh, of scenarios that, that actually happen uh, with, for example, PlayStation Network, they had 77 million account hacked or uh, FedEx, they had also a breach with um, 119,000 scanned docs. Uh, the one in the middle with Uber is interesting. Uh, they actually had one of their private repo that went to public and they had actually hard-coded AWS credentials on it. So you can imagine what was going on. And uh, yeah, then hence the uh, uh, 57 million. A customer and drive, uh, driver information breach. Yeah, cool. So now we have a better understanding of what the motor application is and what's the new risk profile that we have here. Um, so the application code is around 10, 10 to 20%. This is the proprietary code that you, you write within your organization, but then you bring all the open source libraries components, the continuous um, level and the IIC also. So it is important to have guardrails at each of the stages of your pipeline to spot vulnerabilities as your attack surface is bigger. So this will depend on your, on your pipeline, but you can have guardrails at the coding stage where you have um, integration within your ID or within your, your CLI, depending on the branch and repo, if you're using GitHub or GitLab or any others where you're, hosted your, um, you're hosting your repository. In your CICD pipeline, if you're using uh, Jenkins or GitHub Actions or other Azure pipelines or GitHub, uh, GitLab pipelines, these are actually uh, endpoints where you can add those, uh, these guardrails. So let's talk about the secure software development lifecycle. Now that we are aware of our potential attack surface, we need to think about how we can secure our software development lifecycle. And we need to know all of these um, entry points where we could actually uh, implement guardrails. So as mentioned here, the uh, SSDLC process ensure that uh, security assurance activities such as pen trust and testing, could review, threat modeling sessions, and architectures and others. And this is what we do for, for companies, but also this is, uh, things that we could also apply for open source uh, projects that we're working on if we're maintainers and contributors. So this means that the security is a continuous concern for everyone and awareness of security is a consideration for um, all the stakeholders, the maintainers, the contributors, and the users. And there's an early detection and flows and, co um, and cost re reduction on that. The good news is that you can implement guardrails within GitHub, and I will explain how, by using different application actions um, whether it's for a pet project that you want to demonstrate during a job interview or if you're a maintainer of an open source project. Um, the way you can give your project the same level of protection, uh, it's exactly the same that for, uh, for a property project. And I'm going to demonstrate this for a GitHub Marketplace, but this is also uh, available if you're using GitLab or if you're using any other uh, marketplace. This is just for explaining you that you can actually implement uh, those guardrails. So the GitHub Marketplace, for those who don't, don't know, uh, it was introduced during the GitHub universe in 2016. It's a place where developers can find integrations and implement them into their workflows. Uh, so you can see it covers a lot, a uh, lot of things. So CSD tools, code review, security, compliance, dependency management, etc. How you would set up applications and actions. So when you look at implementing uh, an action or an application um, within your project, you will look at different information available. Um, so here on the, on the sidebar, which one you want to, to implement, but also on the project page. If GitHub verify the, the action or the application, you'll see like the little uh, blue tick next to the, um, the, the name of the, uh, the application. How many contributors are working on the, the project? How many stars did the project get? How many issues and pull requests? Because it's open source uh, for, for some of them, so you can have that, that visibility as well. So navigating to the product page will give you more information, obviously. And as a maintainer of a project, you will need to check if this is a suitable tool for your code base. So I'm not gonna uh, push you like using this tool. This, this is, you need to figure it out with your project because you, you're using a specific programming languages, specific pipelines like workflow. Um, but yeah, so navigating to also the uh, GitHub repository and have a look at how actively the maintainers and contributors are pushing into the project. Is it well documented? Uh, do they pro uh, provide basic example usage. So for example, for the uh, GitHub Actions, do you have like a YAML starting file uh, just to, uh, for a starter to implement within your, your project? Is, is it easy to, to implement? Is it easy to understand uh, what kind of uh, feedback you're getting from this, from this tool? And also most importantly, will it cover your needs for your project in terms of programming languages? So when you scroll down, you'll see that uh, usually 90 to 95% of these application actions are completely free for open source uh, and public repos. And when you review the orders, you know, completely free, you can see it's like zero dollars, so it's free. 
uh, what do you need to, to consider? So choosing a tool, um, do you want to have application or action will depend on your project, your team's workflow, what kind of tech stack you're using, are you deploying to Docker if you're using Kubernetes, if those tools covering that? How many steps do you have in your pipeline uh, do, do you have? Can you implement guardrails for each of these uh, steps? So you'll find many tools and applications that could cover your needs. And the good news, as I said for all these maintainers, is that these applications are usually free for public repositories and OSS products. So um, yeah, I'll say experiment, like make use of this because it's, it's free for open source um, products. Um, you can also implement two tools to cover one stage. So for example, if you're taking dependencies, you can implement MEND and Sneak to scan your dependencies. Both tools will have their pros and cons in terms of coverage and it will help you uh, having a better visibility of your dependency uh, on your project. And if you think that one tool is better than the other, then you can still remove the, uh, the one that you don't need. So as I said, experiment. <laughs> and also get the right tools for your project. This is the two things that you need to, to keep in mind. Cool, so let's see now um, what a basic pipeline would be comprised of. So I would say that with the GitHub uh, Marketplace, you can leverage the uh, security application and, and action that you can find there to secure your, your pipeline at each stage of your development. But if we're talking about a really basic pipeline, you'll have three things. You'll, you'll have the software composition analysis, and I'll describe what, what it is. You'll have a tool to prevent uh, secret sprawling, and you'll have a tool to cover static code analysis. So the first one, the SCA, uh, the software composition analysis, focuses on identifying to, um, the open source and the code base so teams can manage their exposure to security and license compliance issues. Here you have some examples of tools that could provide that. So if we have a look at one of them, so just pick one, renovate. Um, the important thing here is to look at which uh, packages are, are covered when you usually um, select one of these, uh, these tools. And as I mentioned, again, these tools are completely free and you can see the, um, at the bottom, what is the terms of the, their, their agreement for the, uh, uh, the OSS, how many scans you, you would have for, for free. Once you configure uh, renovate, and this depends on the tool, like sometimes uh, you'll have to cherry pick your repositories or they'll have a trigger once it's installed. Like in that case for renovate, it will trigger um, a pull request just to initiate the first uh, scan and then it will go from there and you will have this kind of PR that will let you know uh, where, um, to which version you need to bump your, your, uh, your packages. They'll also give you some uh, index of confidence um, I think they're actually um, checking against other open source projects to see if it's, there's no breaking changes in their, in their pipeline, and they'll give you that confidence index. Um, but obviously, um, as a maintainer, you need to check if there's no breaking changes within your, your pipeline. But they give you this, um, this level of information just to understand more what's going on in this pull request. Uh, Sneak as well is doing the same, uh, checking the dependency. Again, as a maintainer, uh, check the programming language that is uh, covered uh, with this tool. Again, this is uh, free for um, open source projects. And in that case, for Sneak, you have uh, a dashboard uh, where you can actually import your, your project for free and it will be monitored continuously and let you know if there's any vulnerability. So not only for your packages, but also for your Docker file and IOC as well. And then you will get, again, um, they will raise a PR um, where you have those, those kind of information. In that case, you can see there's a merge advice. Uh, so be careful when you merge that one because there's, there's quite a bump for that, that version. But also, you will get notified by, by email. So on the left, you have an example of the GitHub Dependabot, which is also scanning your, uh, your dependencies. On the right, you have a notification from, uh, from Sneak. This is to, to show that also those tools are uh, giving you notification and alerts uh, through your email. Cool. The second uh, stage of the pipeline is secret sprawling. So secret sprawling is the unwanted distribution of secrets like API keys or credential through multiple systems. I'm going to talk about GitGuardian in that case. So GitGuardian is a tool that actually um, help you to prevent that uh, happening. So we don't have what, uh, what happened at uh, Uber or uh, PlayStation Network and the, uh, the others. So when you navigate to the GitGuardian page, I'll let you know about more about the, uh, the products. And again, if you scroll down, you'll see that it's completely free on public repositories. And usually when you go to the next screen, uh, this is where they ask you if you want to implement it within all your repositories or only uh, a few selected repositories. In the case of uh, secret scrolling, I would recommend to check all the repositories that you have for your um, uh, open source projects, just to make this historical scan and make sure that you, you haven't pushed any secrets uh, publicly available. 
uh, and then they will ask you more permissions just to integrate through your uh, your projects. Once you've done that, uh, you're redirected to their dashboard where you will have all the important repos and will start scanning. So the first scan is the historical scan that will scan all your code base. And when you push um, new code, when you raise pull requests, it will just check the uh, the delta, the difference for, for that. So I'll give you a little bit more information where uh, there's some secrets. Um, by the way, this this I'm, I'm using the always juice shop, so don't, don't it's fine. It's just yeah, I'll just blame it on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so secrets publicly available. Um, but yeah, as you can see, those tools usually um, have a lot of integrations. And if I mentioned, because I'm talking about the GitHub Marketplace, but you can find integration for usually all the tools and the um, the pipeline and your workflow that you're you're using. For secrets, uh, I would recommend to uh, have it before pushing to the repo. So if you can have it something like a pre-commit within your CLI, because obviously you don't want to have the secret pushed um, to your um, to your GitHub repository. It's, it's actually too late. It's it's on it's publicly available. So make sure for for this one to have it um, to implement the pre-commit. Then the third um, level is a static code analysis. So um, the definition of static code analysis is a method of debugging by examining source code before a program is run is done by analyzing a set of code against a set of coding rules. So I'm taking a few examples of applications that you could, uh, that you could use if you want to. Uh, so Center Cloud, if you have a look at their uh, GitHub actions, then you have more, more information and also the YAML file to uh, get you started. Once you've set up uh, Center Cloud, then you have access to the, the dashboard where you actually um, pushed your repository. Again, it's the always to shop demo in that case. Um, yeah, and they will give you a little bit more visibility and metrics around, uh, obviously, the security vulnerabilities, but also not only that, but with the, also around the uh, code quality, if there's any code smell, duplication, and all of that uh, metrics. And obviously, if you click more, you'll have like more details on all the uh, vulnerabilities that you have within your, your projects. And for those of you who like metrics and knowing how many lines are covered or how many vulnerabilities, you also have that kind of uh, indications uh, with all of these tools, specifically for st um, the static code analysis. They like to have those like heat maps and uh, metrics around, around that. Uh, mentioning LGTM, but actually this one has been acquired by GitHub, so they're gonna deprecate it for uh, CodeQL, but just for, for you to have uh, an idea of all these uh, study code analysis tools, how they work, what are their pattern. So usually when you fetch your, your repo, they will give you a score at the top, you can see they also tell you uh, which language you're, you're using, obviously, and the vulnerabilities that um, are flagged within your, your projects. And as a developer, when you see this and you don't really understand what it is, what's going on there, telling you there's a client side cross site scripting here. So if you click on it, you'll have more details. You'll have a snippet of code on how you could remit it to that, uh, that vulnerability. And you have links to OWASP. That's, that's great, amazing. Um, and again, you have all the, the heat maps and the, um, this, the composition that um, you have for your, your code base. If, you're, if you like numbers and metrics and the heat maps, uh, you'll love those, those tools. The cool thing that I like for LGTM, this is really a fun fact, you can actually compare your project, how well it does with uh, other, um, other open source projects. So depending on your programming language, there's a little bit of gamification here. So moving on to CodeQL, because this is the one that's, that's gonna replace uh, LGTM. This one is free, it's uh, the uh, GitHub tool. Uh, it's free for research and, and open source. And when you uh, implement it, if you go to the GitHub Actions, um, this is where you're going to get started with uh, code scanning with code QL analysis. So when you click on set up this, uh, this workflow, they will actually populate it, pre-populate it. This is really dark, I don't know if you can see it, but they will pre-populate uh, a YAML file uh, with all the steps so you can have this, uh, this workflow integrated within your code base. Just make sure that you have the correct programming languages so they can actually catch the, uh, the vulnerabilities that you have within your code base. And as a GitHub action workflow, you will have all that um, visibility when uh, the workflow is, uh, is triggered and you have all this, this kind of information. Once it's, uh, one of the scan is uh, ran, um, then you can go to the security um, section of your repo and you will have all of this. This is coming from uh, um, their results into Serif um, uh, formats and they've populated this uh, code scanning results. And this is the same that you could find with uh, any other study code analysis uh, tools with the same kind of information here is flagging uh, hard coded credentials. 
Cool. So how does it work on GitHub? Because I've, I've given you um, a few tools and you'd be like, okay, that's great, Sonia, but what's the, what's the end goal? Uh, so on, on GitHub, when the contributor raises a pull request, it will trigger all of the application and actions you've been implemented within your, your pipeline. So you raise your PR and when you scroll down, uh, you will see, like depending on the applications that you've triggered, you'll have all of these little widgets. Also, this will depend on the application if they have all of these widgets enable. But the most important thing is at the uh, complete bottom, you'll have all of the, uh, the tools that you've, uh, you've implemented. And also it will give you some, uh, some visibility if, like, if it's failing. This is like the ideal state, actually. Everything is green, this is, this is amazing. But uh, usually you might have some like, failing or some in the uh, hanging uh, state, so like orange. Uh, but this will give you a visibility of all the, uh, the tools that you've, um, you've actually implemented. And also, again, depending on how it is implemented within, uh, within GitHub, if you click on the uh, checks uh, tab, they'll also give you more info because you might tell um, that's a lot of tools. I don't want to go to each dashboard. You're right. Uh, everything should be on your pull request. You should probably consider it as your source of truth and you shouldn't go on like dozens of, of dashboards. So everything is centralized on your pull requests. How to get value from uh, chat ops? from all the tools also that we've, we're, we've been implementing. So ChatOps is a collaboration model that connects people, tools, pr processes, and automation into a transparent workflow. So if we use a free Slack account where you can have your team of contributors discussing and having dedicated channels for specific tools, that will help you actually have visibility on what is going on in your projects. And also will help you monitoring and setting alerts and because this is a vital piece where developers can help uh, when they get the right information. So this is how it looks like. Um, if you have, uh, you don't need to have a paid account uh, for, for this for, for Slack. And I would recommend to go down with the webhooks route because I know with free account, you might be limited to 10 applications per, uh, per workspace. But if you go down with the webhook uh, route, you might be able to implement all of these uh, tools and have that uh, visibility piece. And also that's an example with, with GitHub. So when you raise the pull request, you will have uh, the uh, in real time little color and know what's if there's any um, fixes or vulnerabilities that has been uh, catched by um, the, uh, the tools. Any documentation on GitHub? Yes, uh, when you're working on an open source project, you can leverage the GitHub project to list all the tasks that you have to work on for a specific feature. You don't need to use fancy tools like Jira and others because we remember that we need to use free tools because open source, so yeah, let's leverage uh, GitHub projects. And you can create labels and epics. Um, so here it's called milestones in um, the case of GitHub to track pro progress or for raising issues. Um, you can create a security label to track vulnerabilities in, in your project. But you can see like on the, uh, on the right side, there's like different milestones with uh, the progress bar. Let me just zoom on one. So yeah, let's take one feature. You have all the, the tickets, all the, um, the cards attached. And the most important thing is when you raise a PR, don't forget to actually set the, um, uh, all those like labels, project milestone on the right side of your PR, because otherwise this will, won't link with your, your project. And you can use automated projects or boards where cards will move accordingly to the status of the pull requests. So this is also a good way to showcase what features you're working on and where you might need some help and contributors. So adding security guardrails at each stage of your pipeline is great, but you can also harden your open source project by applying the following best practices. First one, apply the least privilege um, principle. So you set the base permissions to no permissions on the member privilege section, so they can only clone and pull the public repos. And to give a contributor uh, additional access, the maintainer will need to add them to teams or make them collaborators on individual repos. So you create teams, you add user, and you allocate them to specific repos with specific permission. In that case, you have like better visibility on what's going on, which, which repos. Make 2FA mandatory for all maintainers. Um, and also, if you don't do uh, this this year, uh, GitHub announced that by the end of 2023, they will require all users who contribute code um, to enable one or more forms of uh, 2FA. So they're going to actually enforce it on their, on their website. Review your project controls. This is more for native tools from uh, GitHub. By the way, they're free, like Dependabot, Dependency Graph, Dependabot, and uh, CodeQL. This is to enable them or just to check the uh, threshold if you only want to receive criticals and high and you don't want to have this, this noise uh, usually that you can have with, with the tool and just to address criticals and highs at first. 
Uh, also check if the action permissions, because uh, you might be tempted to have allow all actions, but uh, I would recommend to have allow selected actions. You can allow the actions created by GitHub and the one that uh, are uh, verified creators on the marketplace. And then you can do some due diligence on the actions that you would like to implement on your uh, project and you can add them here. Protect your main branch. So make sure to protect your main branch to avoid any accidental deletion by maintainer. Uh, just add a rule on it and require some of the applications that uh, you've actually implemented. So for example, this is like a dummy uh, PR, but you can see the required label on some. So if you've decided this is like team effort that you don't want to merge um, uh, your PR if a secret is detected, this is required. So if this one is failing, you can't merge it. So this is a way to actually uh, have some thresholds or gates on your on your PR. Enable notification alerts. Um, so for the alerts, this is more for the dependent bots and secret scanning alerts from uh, GitHub. So make sure that you have uh, an email here so it will get notified if something goes wrong. And notification, again, like make sure that you have the right address so you have this, this notification com coming in when there's something discovered in a, on your open source project. Review webhooks. So you might have seen that there's a lot of tools that I've um, uh, mentioned here. So you might be tempted to test two or three, and then at the end of the day, you realize that you actually, uh, some of them don't cover your needs. So do this uh, security hygiene and due diligence exercise, just remove those that are uh, deletes that you're not using. Do not have like stale webhooks. Same for third-party application access policy here. You can see it's like approved denied. Just make sure that you're only keeping the one that you're actively using. And same from the install GitHub apps, you can actually uh, here click on configure, scroll down in the danger zone and just install the one that you're not using anymore. Review your security overview checklist. So by default, um, they don't have all the tick like uh, green. So you need to implement a proper security policy, uh, security advisory, um, dependent bot to the alert and uh, code QL if, if you want to have those, those tools uh, available in your open source project. So you can set up um, a proper security policy to address this. And also if you want to uh, raise a security advisory on one of the open source um, projects that you're working on and contributing. Review your open source checklists. So this is not security wise, this is more because we're welcoming in the open source community and we want everyone to feel welcome. So don't forget to add a description, a readme file, a code of conduct, a contributing uh, file, a license, uh, also a good example or templates of pull requests and uh, issue templates. So all of those, this is just to have this welcoming atmosphere and just to um, give the rules before you contribute to the uh, open source product. Implement open source workflow. Again, this is not really security related, but it's just to, to welcome those who actually push for the first time on your uh, on your open source project. There's um, a GitHub action to, for that, just to say welcome and thank you for your first uh, PR. Uh, there's also one that actually closed the issues in PR for like, closed stale issues. So you have this nice little um, message at the top saying, hey, by the way, you need to clean up all your, your issues because some of them are just here for, for a long time. So you should actually review them. And most importantly, you showcase your open source project status. So if you want to attract more contributors to your project, don't forget to showcase the health of your project using the little labels or text uh, that these applications and action workflow provide and add them at the top of your uh, project on your readme file. Uh, I know that sounds like uh, I'm bragging about my project, but this is more of, you know, like for visibility piece. Uh, it's not only uh, saying that your infrastructure is up and running, but it's also showing that you're taking care about um, uh, uh, test coverage, about security, about compliance, and, and other uh, dimensions. And how you implement them, usually on those tools in the settings uh, tab, you have this uh, create a status bar, just copy paste this markdown little uh, snippet of code, and then you implement it, you add it at the top of your readme file, and this is how it should look like. Also, don't forget to check and add uh, licenses on your open source um, project, because an OSS license protects uh, contributors and users. Um, and if you're not sure about the current uh, correct license to use, um, in, on the license uh, tab, you can see you can click on this link, and they will let you know which uh, which license is a good one to use for your for your project. And then you will it will pre-populate the uh, the license, and you only have to change the year and your name, which is quite convenient in that in that case. And if you're working on, on the websites uh, and not just the components, uh, I would recommend to check your website score um, just for also this uh, 
uh, security hygiene and also probably other like performance with Google Lighthouse, with page uh, speed insights or with the uh, Mozilla Observatory. Uh, this is just to, to give you that uh, those, those metrics. Cool, so I'll finish with some, uh, some tips for you um, on your uh, open source uh, projects. I would recommend to adopt a DevSecOps approach, uh, the same that you would probably have within your, your company, or we like to call it the shift left approach, uh, which is debatable because people will say, yeah, there's also the right, uh, right approach. I know every stage is important, but let's talk about the uh, shift left approach, which is aimed to detect security holes uh, from day one in order to prevent security issues to begin with and to resolve them as quickly as possible if they do indeed arise. The other one is to address open source vulnerability. Um, so obviously we all love um, open source um, projects. We're work, we might probably be maintainers and contributors uh, here in this in this room, but we do need to address vulnerabilities if we uh, we have some in our projects. So having this on ongoing uh, tools for monitoring the vulnerabilities to regularly update your components to patch vulnerabilities as quickly as possible. This is uh, quite critical. Automate simple security tasks because it's virtually impossible to mitigate the endless numbers of vulnerability that exists using a manual approach. So using automation is also critical. And you've seen with uh, those tools, once it's, it's done, they will raise PR for you. So you can just review and see if you can merge it through, uh, through a code base. Be aware of your own assets. Uh, so visibility is the first step towards gaining insights into uh, your project. Uh, security states, and as you can't secure what you haven't identified. Um, so knowing precisely which as assets makes up uh, your application or your components uh, is really key. Um, and yeah, and this also drives to the discussion that we have around uh, SBOMS, uh, software bill of materials. So this is also feeding through, through that side. And finally, security training for developers. Uh, developers, we are responsible for pushing code into production or into our components. So it's critical that we receive training from um, from all of your security team, also uh, having uh, access to uh, resources that actually uh, help us to upskill. So obviously I have to mention all of us with all the amazing uh, work and the amazing guides, which is everything is free. So it's, it's really great to have a look at it. Uh, I will also uh, do a shout out to um, try hack me, hack the box. If you're also interested in those like more uh, um, uh, red teaming, uh, attacking, uh, but they also do have uh, academies um, there. We have modules to, to understand. And the same with uh, background and hacker one that you have academies to um, give you more courses on those security vulnerabilities. And also uh, Sneak Learn, I have to <laughs> say, uh, they do a free, uh, they, we do have a free uh, website called uh, Sneak Learn that also gives you um, one pager on vulnerabilities depending on your ecosystem. Uh, it sends boxes and you can try the, uh, the vulnerability and have a better understanding of it. So this is important as developers that we understand what is going on uh, above the, the security jargon that we usually use. Cool, some key takeaways. Um, so open source component can be a vector for large scale cyber attacks. We've seen it last year with vulnerability in Apache Log4j. And why not all the software written in Java was vulnerable at that, were vulnerable at that, uh, at that time. The affected package is widely used by developers and there are many applications and services that use this library. And we've seen big tech firms like Microsoft, VMware, Amazon, IBM, they were, uh, they were affected. Having visibility throughout your pipeline using different tools and guardrails is critical to re uh, reduce your attack surface. And I hope with the iceberg analogy, you had a better understanding of what is going on. It's not only your proprietary codes, you're actually bringing vulnerabilities with all the uh, different layers. And we have seen that leveraging the application and actions from the uh, GitHub marketplace could help. Uh, also as maintainers and contributors, do not hesitate to create a small pipeline for a start and experiment with some of these tools and also harden your GitHub projects for everyone to and contribute to it. Um, so yeah, experiment, but most importantly, please don't push your keys on GitHub, please. <laughs> Cool, so uh, I'm Sonia Morrison. I'm a senior security advocate at Sneak. I'm passionate about DevSecOps, open source, and cloud security. Um, I'm doing a lot of things outside of Sneak. I'm not gonna bore uh, you with this, but you can reach out to me on LinkedIn at Sonia Moisset. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Alice London for having me today. Uh, and yeah, stay safe in your journey to open source security contributions. Thank you. for this talk. Um, I'm uh, sure there will be lots of questions. I've got the first question. Um, 
you show the very interesting slide about GitHub private security hygiene. I don't think I've seen this anywhere else. Uh, this is the public best practices of the Do you have this in a form or by a format, by web page, or maybe a new or what? Yeah, so uh, last week I did a piece with uh, Good Guardian, uh, where I actually sum up all of these uh, best practices. So I would first redirect uh, to this um, Good Guardian uh, blog post. I'm also working with Precode Camp to have a more in depth uh, uh, GitHub best practices. Um, so yeah, this will be coming on the next uh, few months. Uh, but you're giving me an idea with, with all of us now. Um, yeah, <laughs> we also have some uh, discussions with the Open SSF also on that side. So yeah, watch the space. I think there's, there's, I think there's one. and you get all of this in the pipeline. How much does it affect the pipeline? Yeah, so uh, what I mentioned is usually when you first implement these tools, they'll do historical scan, which take um, usually the most time. But then after when you raise a PR, it will only check the delta. So only the piece of code that you've actually pushed will be checked by these tools. So it should be a matter of seconds in that case. No questions? So Git Guardian, yes, it's a marketplace tool. How much how much access does it have to your code base that it scans? It's not doing it locally, obviously, as it is. It's not doing it. Is it doing it on? Oh, on your, no, your you need to or? you need to upload your uh, your repository on their service, then they they can scan it. Another uh, mm. word on. I think actually the. Mm, I'm not sure about that one. That's more like for a Git Guardian question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. that's not, that's um, obviously yeah, I love so, what so, they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. What will happen to them though? <laughs> Something may may happen, in, you know. Um, oh. It would be an interesting thing to to maybe research. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. No, I, I totally agree with, with you. But yeah. Yes. <laughs> any any more questions? Less of, a, uh, less of a question, more an observation. And I know everybody hates these at presentations like this, but Dijkstra in 1970 pointed out that you can never have a secure pipeline because if someone nobles your compiler, no matter how secure your code is, the compiler can put what it likes in. And the same is true of a pipeline system. That's all. I just wanted to raise the point that you can take all the precautions in the world but you can never guarantee anything. You still need human eyes on the project. Yeah, no, no, you're totally true. But this is this is more like a starting point. Like, yeah, this is better to have something that that nothing. But yeah, in that case, you can't do anything about it. But. 